Of all the construction sites in the world, few have generated more contention or debate than New York's World Trade Center. You'll probably recognize one World Trade Center that sits here. It's now an iconic skyscraper that rises beside the footprints of the original Twin Towers. But what you might not be aware of is that it's actually part of a much bigger development of skyscrapers all around the 9-11 memorial site. But notice this giant gap right here. It's like something's missing. If you look at the latest rendering of the site, you'll see another shiny new skyscraper that's supposed to be standing right here. But go to Google Maps or even walk down here and you'll see there's just some colorful murals on some steel sheds opposite the Oculus. Now, this isn't just a fancy art exhibit. It's actually the unfinished foundations of a massive new skyscraper called Two World Trade Center. And just over here, there's another empty site where a residential tower called Five World Trade Center is supposed to sit. Developers once thought these buildings would all be wrapped up by 2020, yet here we are in 2022. The remaining buildings are just renders, and there's two gaping holes in what's arguably one of the world's most important regeneration projects. And most intriguingly of all, when you try and find out why that is, you hit a bit of a brick wall. We want to rebuild the World Trade Center as the World Trade Center, but better, a little bit taller, a lot stronger, just plain better. After the attacks on September 11, 2001, people moved out of downtown and so did businesses. The only way to stem this exodus was to prove to people that we're going to rebuild, and we did. The New York City skyline is a graveyard for broken projects, projects that never happened. Development is not a, it's not a very clean sport, it's a blood sport, it gets messy. The redevelopment of the Trade Center has taken an excruciating long time. There's just a lot of cooks in the kitchen when it comes to the World Trade Center, is the best way to put it. In simple terms, we're going to tell you the story of the battle to finish New York's new World Trade Center. But that story reveals a lot about how money, politics and design determine the future of this city. If there's one thing New York is known for, it's skyscrapers. Every year it feels like there's another one going up around the block. These awe-inspiring structures have pretty much come to define this city, their evolution now standing as an historic record of our engineering progress. But how exactly does a skyscraper even get built? Well, we kind of specialise in that on this channel, and we might have covered the process of digging a hole, putting up some steel beams and building a super tall structure just a few times before. It's a really exciting and important step, and don't you worry, we are going to get to it in loads of detail. But Right now, I'm talking about all the stuff that happens way before that. There's a lot that needs to happen just to reach the point of putting that first spade in the ground, and especially in New York City. To help you try and get your head around it, we've broken it down into four main stages. Stage one, location and acquisition. Developers first need to choose where they want to build their skyscraper. All kinds of things like land value, sidewalk circulation, zoning laws, and the need for a skyscraper in the area, all factor into where these towers get constructed. Now, few people know more about skyscrapers than the founder of the B1M, but just to make sure I had it right, I called Professor Jason Barr. He's a guy who studies the economics of these buildings. There's a lot of um, desire to be in clusters where a lot of firms are in general and where your employees will want to work. You know, it tends to evolve in Manhattan, you know. Downtown was aging and Midtown was the hot, you know, district for many years and firms started going back down the World Trade Center area. Now they're, some of them are moving to Hudson Yards. So a lot of the hot pockets can change based simply on where new space is opening up. Developers need to actually acquire the lots they're eyeing, which usually means buying out current owners, and according to Jason, this stage can take years, or even decades to complete. Once developers have the land to build on, they're ready to move on to stage two, design. Now, most skyscrapers fall into one of two main categories, residential, filled with apartments or even a hotel, or commercial, used for offices and retail stores. 
Some skyscrapers have mixed uses, some have viewing platforms and sky pools, but you get the broad idea. So if you have acquired a fairly large lot in a nice location, then the next step would be to start getting plans drawn up, they hire an architect, the architect works with engineers to make sure that the building can be constructed. In the third stage comes financing. Of course, there's sometimes a bit of this up front too before land acquisition happens, but developers usually need a good idea of where a building will be and what it might look like before they can raise finance. Now, New York is pricey. If you thought renting an apartment or buying a property here was steep, try constructing a skyscraper. It's one of the world's most expensive cities to build in. Your average commercial tower here costs around $6,000 per square meter. It's $5,000 in Chicago and a little over $3,000 in Tokyo. So developers either need a lot of their own cash or a loan to pay for construction costs. Then of course there's the last stage, the process of actually building these massive structures. Now I love a bit of skyscraper engineering, so let's get into it. Putting all this into layman's terms, the process starts by digging into the earth and bedrock to create the building's foundation. Usually, this will be made up of concrete pillars called piles that will support the skyscraper's superstructure above, and the layout varies depending on the design and weight of the building. Then it's on to the superstructure, which is usually formed of either reinforced concrete or steel around a concrete core, or in some cases a combination of both. Steel frames tend to be the most common approach in New York City. Normally, workers build a concrete core in the center, housing the building's stairs, services, and elevator shafts. Steel framing is then steadily built around the core as it rises, and concrete floors are laid across the beams. Finally, the building is clad in concrete, aluminium, or glass, and then fitted out internally with mechanical and electrical services. One particular quirk of New York City is that, unlike almost anywhere else on Earth, the steel frame rises before the concrete core. It all goes back to those iconic black and white images and the steel workers' unions. They like to have clear working areas away from other trades as far as possible. Now, that's a very simple overview of the four-step process, but not all skyscraper projects manage to clear every hurdle. Some get stuck in certain stages and never become reality. New York has completed more of these buildings than almost any other city in the world, with the exception of Hong Kong. Today, it's home to iconic legends like the Chrysler Building, Empire State, and One World Trade Center. Buildings we'd all instinctively think of when we hear the word skyscraper. Lower Manhattan is where New York City's first skyscraper was built, and over the years, it transformed into a high-rise financial hub. Before One World Trade Center stood here, the downtown area was of course home to the Twin Towers. They were the tallest buildings in the world when they first completed back in 1973, and once defined the city's skyline. Back then, they were owned by the Port Authority of New York City and New Jersey, a quasi-independent government agency that maintains certain infrastructure across the two states. The agency built the towers in hope of boosting development in the neighborhood, but it had the opposite effect. Vacancy rates grew while the real estate value sank. It wasn't until the economic boom of the 1990s that more people started using them. Over the years, the Port Authority came under pressure to sell the World Trade Center, it was never supposed to be in the real estate business. In July 2001, American businessman Larry Silverstein signed a 99-year lease on the Towers and other authority-owned properties for 3.2 billion US dollars. Then came one of America's darkest days. This just in, we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. There's no doubt there was a huge explosion and fire, lots of black smoke coming from that building into, oh, oh my goodness, oh God. there's another one. In the wake of 9-11, the world began to debate what would become of the Ground Zero site and what could ever fill the painful gap now left in the city's skyline. Should the Twin Towers be restored, or should a completely new structure assume their place? Should the site be a memorial, or should the city replace the significant amount of commercial office space that had been lost? 
Some believed there should be nothing built at all. Just weeks after the attack, Silverstein sparked a legal battle that hindered any moves on construction for nearly the next six years. When he signed the lease for the Twin Towers in 2001, he had to take out a $3.5 billion insurance policy on the buildings. But he and his lawyers argued that the attack occurred as two separate events, and the policy should therefore pay out double the amount. Silverstein sought $7.1 billion, but in the end was awarded just $4.6 billion, which went towards paying rent to the Port Authority and potential future projects. Meanwhile, the debate around how to reconstruct the site was rumbling on, and that second stage of creating a skyscraper, designing it, was causing a bit of a hold-up. After initially holding a contest with over 2,000 submissions in late 2002, the city chose this master plan design by Studio Liebskind. The initial idea included a 1,776-foot spindle-shaped structure called the Freedom Tower. The building's height would nod to the year of American independence and stand beside four other descending skyscrapers in a semicircle that kind of bowed to the memorial site. At the time, developer Silverstein thought it could all be built by 2020. Different architects were brought in to design their own skyscrapers within the framework of Liebskin's overall master plan. And it's fair to say that caused just a little bit of friction, particularly with the Freedom Tower, which was being designed by David Childs of Skidmore, Owings & Merrill. Parties wrestled to balance the desire for commercial space with the very real yearning for sombre symbolism. Some wanted a strong building, where others wanted an elegant one. The result was a bit of a compromise all round that's ended up going on to become iconic, though largely because of its height and site location. Today, there are now a total of four commercial skyscrapers planned for the site. Given this was now one of the most important and iconic construction sites in American history, pretty much everyone wanted to put their stamp on how the site should look, and that design stage took longer than expected. Eventually, the site slowly took shape. A new memorial and moving underground museum were constructed. Four World Trade Center opened in 2013, followed by the Freedom Tower, then renamed One World Trade Center in 2014, and Three World Trade Center, the latest edition, in 2018. Now, the money to develop the entire site came from a handful of different sources for each building, including a combination of Silverstein's insurance proceeds, the US federal government, and Liberty Bonds, a federal tax-exempt program. But one of the four skyscrapers hasn't really made it past the drawing board, and while there's been plenty of disagreement and architectural debate about what it should actually look like, the bigger hold-up might actually be about the money. So, who exactly is paying for all these skyscrapers to go up, and how do projects like this really make it past stage three of the process? Well, it depends. One option that some have is through government funding, but that ain't too common in New York. It's normally reserved for special projects or housing. One World Trade Center is one of those special developments that largely relied on the US federal government's money for its construction. The final cost of that remarkably symbolic and physically robust building was nearly 4 billion US dollars, one of the most expensive skyscrapers ever built in the US. Normally, developers looking to build a skyscraper either dip into their own money or more commonly put together a business case and request loans from lenders to cover their construction costs. Those lenders might be entities like banks. Frankly, those lenders want to be sure that they're going to get their money back. And one way that a big new development like Two World Trade Center can build confidence is by securing what's known as an anchor tenant before construction. Anchor tenants uh, are usually large firms that rent a substantial amount of space. Uh, and they'll pre-lease this space, usually before even the shovel hits the ground. And so if an anchor tenant, a large law firm, a large media firm, signs on a large lease for, let's say, 200,000 square feet of space, which could be 20% of the building, for example, it signals to all of the players involved that there is a demand and interest in the building. Anchor tenants are looking at what a building has to offer, things like amenities and location. Doing a big deal early on as the anchor means these companies can usually expect to pay less rent. 
A big anchor tenant can even help transform its surrounding neighbourhoods. When Vice and Etsy decided to move their offices to Brooklyn, the borough exploded in popularity. But finding the right company to sign a multi-million dollar lease can be a hard sell. And that's what's been happening over at Two World Trade Center. Simply put, Silverstein hasn't been able to convince any firm to move their offices into the new building. It's been through multiple radical redesigns and it's still not part of this city's skyline. Ah, super kawaii. Ah! Ah! You ever felt this way? Way back in 2005, architecture firm Foster & Partners was awarded the rights to design the upcoming project. It unveiled ideas for a 387 metre structure of four interconnecting columns that created a slanted diamond at their summit. The lower levels would be built out as banking trading floors in an attempt to lure financial anchor tenants. For a site right by Wall Street, that made great sense. Now, that idea for Two World Trade Center even made it to the final stage of the process. Workers broke ground and started the foundations with the idea of finishing the whole thing by 2011. The project began without an anchor tenant and instead relied on Liberty Bonds that were available at the time. But it didn't get very far. Rumours began circulating that Silverstein was struggling to find the necessary anchor tenants to make the structure financially viable. After 9-11, the state of the downtown area began to change. No longer was it filled with just financial companies and Wall Street bankers. Instead, media and tech companies began moving in. Condé Nast, the company that owns Vogue and GQ, even signed a 25-year lease for a whopping 21 floors of One World Trade Center. Meanwhile, the original financial institutions were looking elsewhere and banks were no longer enticed by the scheme. With no anchor tenant, the developers moved on from Foster & Partners design. Construction works all came to a halt down here in 2012, leaving behind just the foundations, which also contain the mechanical systems for the Oculus. That's the transportation hub just behind me. But instead of giving up on the building, Silverstein came up with another plan. In 2015, he reportedly turned to a foreign visa program to try and bring in some funding from China. And then in 2015, he brought on a new and sort of younger architect to redesign the tower. And it was back to stage two. Enter Bjark Ingels. The architect's design took things in an entirely new direction and lit up social media. Gone were the banking trading floors, and in came the attempts to entice more media and tech companies with edgy workspaces and studios. The building became a series of stacked boxes that descended in a stepped formation, each tailored to a different company's activities. It would have greenfield terraces and rise 408 meters above Manhattan. It worked. The media executives of 21st Century Fox and News Corporation signed an initial agreement and planned to move in during 2020 once their midtown leases had expired. They were even offered millions of dollars in subsidies and tax credits to make the move downtown easier. Things for Two World Trade Center were looking up. But not long after, a few big problems began to surface. The team were trying to build off foundations for a different, earlier version of the skyscraper. Lots would need to be reconfigured. In 2016, the finalized deal with the media companies fell through. Suddenly, developers at Silverstein were said to be no longer certain about which design to go with, moving back and forth between Bjark Ingels and Foster. That all caused development on Two World Trade Center to stall once again. For years, the project remained in limbo and Silverstein focused on signing other leases on the site. Then in January 2020, some fresh news broke. Silverstein was reportedly going back to the deal with Foster & Partners. Yes, after all that, the developer decided to stick with the original architect. But given the history and the amount of time that had gone by, Silverstein made it clear he wouldn't be going back to the old design from Foster. Instead, something more contemporary was going to be worked up. But that was early 2020, and we all know what happened that year. We're going to begin here with the outbreak of a mystery virus in China. SARS-like virus. By tonight, New York State's 19 million residents will be under a stay-at-home order. Yeah, so not an ideal time for convincing people to back a new office building. So that's what brought us to today. The developers haven't been able to agree on a design, and that's made it hard to get tenants signed up. 
But what's not so clear is what's happening now. And as we've discovered through our investigation, it's actually pretty hard work trying to find out what's really happening down at one of the world's most iconic construction sites. We've tried reaching out to several people either involved or with knowledge about Two World Trade Center, but we've hit a lot of dead ends. People either didn't reply or directed us to other sources who also didn't reach back for comment. Silverstein Properties didn't respond to our repeated requests for comment. What we do know is that Silverstein has confirmed to the media on several occasions that it's confident this structure will grow up eventually, but that's as far as most reporters get. But it wasn't total silence. We did hear back from a couple of real estate experts in the city who gave us some insight into what they thought might be happening and how that compares to the rest of New York. I mean, my understanding about Two World Trade Center is, you know, they want to build it when it's financially feasible. Because at the end of the day, you know, you have to be able to cover your expenses and cover your construction costs. And a lot of it is really because there's so many people invested in what gets built. And you also don't want to, you know, saturate the market all at one time in one place so heavily. The market for construction financing for ground up new development towers is very challenging if you're building office, right? The capital markets froze during the pandemic, but our have come back. Now interest rates have gone up again. When interest rates go up, it becomes a lot more expensive to build. So you will see that interest rates will affect the rate of construction in New York and other places, right? So now interest rates are high. We're talking about an office market that is, again, as I said, there's a lot of questions around it. Do workers need that kind of hub anymore? Do you need a million square feet? As of today, there's still no official word on what the latest design for Two World Trade Center is going to look like. But that didn't stop a few renders leaking in early 2022. Instead of those four diamond-shaped columns, the design has vertical sections that alternate in height starting at around 411 meters. Each section is divided by metal fins, and those greenfield terraces that seem to be the current trend on nearly every skyscraper render get to stay. If this design is confirmed, then Foster & Partners will have significantly altered its original proposal from 2006. Fair enough, 16 years have gone by. But what happens if Silverstein can't secure an anchor tenant with this new design? There are other ways to, maybe he could slice and dice the building, and instead of looking for one giant tenant, to start things off, you get 10 smaller tenants who fill the same space, right? Maybe this is a almost like a food court type of situation where you have, you know, a Tammy hub or a tech hub or a media hub, and it's branded and marketed in that way. In general, building at a site with such a heavy and well-known past has proven difficult. The gap in the master plan shows just how important it is to find the right tenants to fill a commercial skyscraper. The wrong design won't bring the right tenants to work there, and that can make it impossible for anything to get off the ground. Now that downtown Manhattan is evolving, it's a question of who it can attract, and when. This video is made possible by Masterworks. Two World Trade Center's struggles probably haven't been helped by the huge losses that have hit Wall Street this year. $13 trillion was wiped out in the worst six-month stretch the stock market has ever seen. That's more than the GDP of Japan, Germany and the UK combined. But it's not just big companies feeling the pain, everyday investors are too. Best case scenario, a typical stock-heavy portfolio is expected to flatline this year, according to Goldman Sachs. One study found that 8 in 10 ultra-high net worth individuals are already investing outside the stock market and into alternative investments like art. Even a New York Times report says that when stock markets take a dive, people look to invest in art. Arts outpaced the S&P 500 for the last 26 years by more than double, so it makes sense that Masterworks is seeing more demand than ever. They let you invest in this same high-value contemporary art from legends like Picasso and Banksy for a fraction of the price. When Masterworks resells a painting you're invested in, you get a share of the potential profits. Despite a pandemic, struggling stock market and record high inflation, Masterworks has sold six paintings for an average net return of 29% to their investors. 
There's a waitlist to join their already 500,000 members, but you can skip it by clicking the link in the description. Now, let's get back to the video. If you can't find a business to use a skyscraper, what about giving people a place to live? Nowadays, the office plays a very different role in our lives than it did when this building was first put forwards all those years ago. One thing is clear. New York City lags far behind other large cities when it comes to housing inventory. There's not enough supply to meet the demand, and it's contributing to skyrocketing rents. For New York, this problem isn't exactly a new one. Housing is in constant demand. Residential high-rise construction has been the dominant form of high-rise construction in the last 20, 25, 30 years. Office markets tend to go in these sort of longer cycles. You'll have a building boom of offices, then the, too much space comes online for a while. One of the many new residential skyscrapers planned to go up is actually right here at the World Trade Center complex. And if you look at the outline again, you'll see that this building too has yet to be built. Alongside some office space, the 274-metre 5 World Trade Center would contain some 1,200 new apartments, and there'd be a pedestrian bridge linking it to the elevated Liberty Park. At the moment, about 25% of the units are set aside for affordable housing. And because housing is so badly needed in New York right now, it's a bit further ahead in the process than 2 World Trade Center. The plan for the affordable units falls under a requirement from the city's mandatory inclusionary housing program. It says that any new developments in rezoned neighborhoods must use 20 to 30 percent of its floor area for affordable properties. And that could mean you change a, a manufacturing building to residential. It could mean that you were only allowed to build a four story building here. and Now you can build a 40 story building here, whatever it is that if you do that you have to set aside a portion for income restricted housing where it's reserved for people making less than a certain amount of money and rents are set at a certain rate and can only increase by a, a certain percentage each year but some activists are fighting for the skyscraper to be 100 percent affordable in fact the tallest affordable housing structure in the world they argue that it should be home to those families and survivors affected by the events of 9-11. The only way that could happen is if somebody bought him out and took ownership of the building and ran that building at a loss. I mean, because, you know, if you're going to spend two to three billion dollars on that structure, you're going to have to come up with a way to generate the revenue to pay for it. Now, many elected officials say there is value in adding more affordable units to an area. But they also recognise that subsidising construction costs might not be the best use of their already limited resources. In recent months, the state government has made several moves on construction and funding for affordable housing developments throughout New York. But these are much smaller and don't face the same obstacles or spotlight as Five World Trade Centre. You know, there's a real difference between, you know, a process for figuring out what you want to do with the World Trade Center and a process to see if you want to put up an apartment building in College Point. One affects the neighborhood. The other one really does affect, uh, you know, not just the entire city, but the region and, and arguably even beyond that. With so much history and tragedy tied to it, the World Trade Center is one of the most unique and challenging construction sites on the planet. Both two and five World Trade Center find themselves confronted with immense challenges just to put a spade in the ground. But while their issues might be particularly extreme, they aren't exclusive. Right across this city, new skyscraper projects face the same challenges, finding the right businesses to buy space in a changing economy building apartments that provide housing people really need, and securing the money to make it all happen. I mean, the New York City skyline is a graveyard for broken projects, projects that never happen. One of the most vivid examples is the redevelopment that Jared Kushner and Charlie Kushner's company wanted to do with 666 Fifth Avenue. They had brought in a Chinese partner called Anbang at the time, 
and they wanted to do this $5 billion redevelopment of that skyscraper. That never happened. The Sony building, which is 550 Madison Avenue, beautiful Philip Johnson design building, the initial plan during the condo boom was to turn that into luxury condos as well. And instead, a Saudi group came in, bought it, and is just continuing to run it as offices. At the end of the day, the developers of commercial and residential skyscrapers all want to turn a profit. But without consensus on a design or funding, structures will get stuck in those initial stages of development. Even skyscrapers that already exist are having to adapt to the changes brought on by the pandemic. Downtown vacancies in cities aren't back to pre-pandemic levels. With many older buildings sitting empty, cities are looking for alternatives to fill the space. These older buildings in downtown Manhattan are better suited to become apartments. If you have an old office building, and a lot of them are built in kind of what we call a wedding cake fashion, where you have a larger base and then kind of a slender tower, those slender towers make for perfect apartment layouts. Though it may be at the extreme end of the scale, New York's World Trade Center showcases many of the challenges and sensitivities facing construction projects today, and especially our skyscrapers. These buildings define our cities and reflect the state of our societies back to us. They're a product of the struggles that got them off the ground and the forces that shaped them. The result is a record of our history preserved in concrete and steel. Whatever structures rise from these sites will become a part of New York's story. This video was made possible by Masterworks. You can skip their queue at the link below. And as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, subscribe to the B1M.